Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CSIS. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I direct our international security program here today. Um, we at CSIS are really proud to have a series on implementing innovation run by Andrew Hunter, who directs our Defense Industrial Initiatives Group in our international security program. Um, it's been a series focused on moving the conversation about how to enable innovation in government beyond a discussion just about technology into a discussion about how organizations better foster innovation. This past year, I was a member of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy for the United States, and this idea of fostering innovation was one of our major findings um, about where the department needs to go in its implementation of the 2018 National Defense Strategy. And of course, we've just had the, the budget release, at least the top line release, uh, which I'm sure will come up today in terms of how far the department has traveled and how much further it has to travel on this issue of innovation. And who better to be here this morning to talk to us about this issue than Dr. Will Roper. Uh, Will is the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. He is the uh, Air Force's Service Acquisition Executive and as such is responsible for and oversees Air Force research, development, and acquisition activities. Prior to his current position, many of you I'm sure know that Dr. Roper was the founding director of the Strategic Capabilities Office at the Pentagon. Established in 2012, the SCO imagines new and often unexpected uses of existing government and commercial systems, extending their shelf life and restoring surprise to the military playbook. And as I mentioned, Will is joined today by our own Andrew Hunter, the director of the Defense Industrial Group, and a senior fellow in the International Security Program. We're going to begin with uh, Will making a few comments once we get this podium moved off the stage, and uh, then into a moderated discussion led by Andrew. So please join me in welcoming Will. Uh, thank you very much, Kath. Thank you, Andrew. Um, when you're asked to leave the Pentagon and talk about innovation in the future, it's not a hard sell. <laughs> um, if you know me, I'm an optimist about our future. I, I'm a realist about what we need to do to have our future be bright, but I'm an optimist that we can pull it off. It has been wonderful seeing the talent and creativity that the Air Force has. It really does value innovation. It values people that are willing to push against the system. It's deep in the DNA and roots. And so what we really have to do in, in my part of the Air Force, in acquisition, is shift from being a culture that is solely focused on the balance sheet, on cost, and shift to a competitive mindset. Right? We're competing for the future. Future airmen that are not in the force today, in schools and colleges around the country, are counting on us making today count, making days and weeks count, not years and decades in the old school model. And competing means that we have to speed up acquisition. All of you, if you know defense, and I know all of you do, um, it, it's far too slow in this century. The model that won the Cold War brought into this century is too slow. And so if you look at the pace of technology change, we should be fearful of having a slow acquisition system. You know, who knows what the next technology that's going to change national security will be? I'm sure you could get lots of people who would come give you a talk on that, but you wouldn't believe any of them. There are so many possibilities between AI and autonomy and synthetic biology and quantum systems and ubiquitous sensing. It, it, who knows? Maybe it's all of them. So you can't imagine being competitive if the system that can ingest those technologies, use them and field them is slower. And so I'm very, really focused on year one, just seeing how fast can the acquisition system go. And it's amazing when you, when you delegate authority and you tell people the reins are yours, the accountability is yours, the product is yours, they take responsibility and they move. You don't have to convince people out in the field that the threats we face in terms of China and Russia are real, that it's a chess game that's going to play out over time and it'll be won by continuing to produce new systems, new conundrums, new things that they react to so that we are not reacting to them. I'm really pleased to say that Air Force has been able to take out on average four years out of major programs just using new authorities that Congress has given. So I'm, I'm satisfied that if we keep the accelerator down, that the engine will rev up and we'll be able to pull the timeline for acquisitions down to years, not decades. But what I'm really excited about this year is that once you have a, a competitive engine that can move at relative uh, speeds, speeds that are, are competitive in today's world, 
then you want to plug it in to a broader set of people. You want to work with everyone. Everyone that has a good idea should be connected to your engine. And so you know that we have historical relationships with our defense primes, our defense companies, and we still need them. But we have historically had a difficult time working with commercial startups, tech startups, and just dual use companies in general. And the thing I'm really excited about is coming off a, a, a fairly uh, energizing event last week in New York where we tried doing a pitch day just like commercial investors do. We had 51 companies in to give their pitch. It's 15 minutes, 10 for them, five for questions for us. And folks, this was a no kidding source selection. We picked companies that we thought connected with our mission. They walked out of their pitch, signed a half page contract, and were paid in less than 15 minutes on average. Fastest we did was three. And I don't even think we understand in the Air Force what a big deal this is gonna be. Our cash is non-dilutive. Right? Our return on investment expectations are small. We're not going to own equity in companies. And we're faster than commercial investors. That was what one company told us. You're faster than the commercial investors I work with. Our mission's inspiring. And there are so many technology applications that can plug into it. Who wouldn't want to work with us given all of those attributes? So pitch day was super exciting for me, and I wish I could just do that full time. And if someone will take this job, I'm gonna make that my job in acquisition. But I've pushed this authority out to the field. They're gonna be running events locally where we do acquisition, and even in cities where we don't have presence. We've gotta, if we don't have brick and mortar or a base there, we need to have presence if there's a technology innovation spark in that city. So I'm very interested to see what the field is gonna do with the ability to put startups on contract using credit cards, government credit cards. And our secretary, I, I believe, will soon announce where the next event will be. But what I'm thinking about is, well, what's beyond that? We push the events out to the field, but shouldn't we do something centrally? So we're thinking about having a, a pitch bowl, a, a, the equivalent of the Super Bowl of pitch events, where the winners out in the field get to come in for a truly game-changing investment from the Air Force, their big chance to productize their idea and impact our mission and hopefully the world. I, I put this out to say we've got to find a way to do this at scale because if we don't, the, the, the burgeoning uh, startup community that continues to push technologies that's changing the world will not be fully connected with us. If there's single events done at my level occasionally, this has to be common and routine. And the reason to do it is just look at the world. Look at the world today. It's aerospace crazy. It's a great time to be in Air Force. It, drones continue to get better performance. Their cost is coming down. Autonomy is continuing to increase their ability to be self-sufficient. We're finally starting to see self-flying cars, which, you know, we all watch the Jetsons. Finally, that appears like it's going to happen at some point, and I'm excited about that. And then look at space. Companies that are going to launch satellites from airplanes. Space planes are becoming uh, increasingly uh, uh, possible and cost effective that could blur the domain between blue sky and black. And more and more services moving to space in the commercial space renaissance we're experiencing. It's an awesome time to be in Air Force. We should be right there with those companies, innovating, pushing boundaries and breaking them. But we're not because their aspirations are at the world level, not the Air Force level. And if we don't find a way to partner with them and work with them at the speed that today demands, then we'll be behind the power curve and we will lose to countries that are able to crack that curve. So the Air Force is out ahead. We've got a way to work with them. We've done one event. One event is not a trend. So I'm very excited to see once we get commercial startups, commercial companies connected with us at their early stages where we can be a great partner with them, what does that do to our industry base year after year, decade after decade? And what I hope people will be able to say at future CSIS events, my, my successors, is that our industry base is growing. The number of companies working with us is growing. And if that happens, given the creativity that I see in our airmen, and the creativity that I know is in this country and our commercial industry base, then our future is bright. 
And I can say that I am an optimist about our future, and I'm realistic because of the talent that's backing it up. Andrew? Well, thank you very much for those comments, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to digging in on this. So uh, I thank you very much, very much again for joining us this oh, morning. Uh, I know we've talked back and forth for a little while to get, uh, to get you over here, uh, but you've been generous with your time, and you, you've come here before, so we appreciate that. I'm happy to, Andrew. Um, I kind of wanted to start with uh, something you touched on, which is uh, what I would characterize as kind of this edge versus center uh, issue. And with innovation, uh, you see a lot of cases there are edge organizations that are able to be very innovative, have a reputation for innovation. You know, a big Safari, DARPA, um, uh, your organization, old organization, the SCO, uh, SOCOM, have, have expressed these characteristics. And what's fascinating to me is you went from being director of the SCO, where innovation was kind of the central mandate that you were handed when you founded that organization, and now you're at the center uh, in big Air Force and the assistant secretary's job, and uh, is it possible to bring that competitive innovation mindset into the core of the organization and still do all the things that the, you know, the bureaucracy was mm -hmm. kind of created to do in the first place to the extent that they still need doing? Uh, it's, it, I'm smiling because I remember before I was going to join the Air Force when I was in that uh, interregnum, I had so many people tell me, everything that you learned at SCO about doing innovation is not going to apply at the big Air Force level. That was such a consistent comment to me. But many of the people giving it to me have not been innovators. Why should I believe them? Why should we believe that innovation can only happen in small Petri dishes? Now true, it is nice to work in a small Petri dish, and I enjoyed working at SCO. I still love all of my team members that are there, and it's great to get to see them in this job. Knowing someone's first name and having that close connection and being able to walk down the hall is great. It's an advantage. But it is not the only way innovation happens. And so innovation happens when you get the culture right. And you, you have to organize a culture around something where people can connect to the mission. Well, we've got mission in spades. And so it's, we've got to clarify what the mission of acquisition is. And if we make the mission ringing dollars and cents out of programs, I don't think, is that inspiring to hear that said? It doesn't inspire me. It's good to do, it's diligence, it's a necessary function of acquisition, but that does not get me up in the morning. I don't think it gets anyone up that's building cutting edge systems for the future warfighter. Competing against an adversary is, that is a mission. Today counts, what you do today counts. And so the big shift that we've made in the Air Force, which I'm seeing take root out in the field so that innovation can happen at scale, is shifting from focusing on money to time. Because everyone can plug into time. Not everyone's job in acquisition can, connects to cost directly. But everyone can decide to push the envelope, do things differently, do things faster. So when you do that, and you delegate the authority so people have a reasonable amount of control of their destiny, and creative people take the reins. So it takes a lot of energy pumped into the system to keep this going. I don't want to undersell that. A bureaucracy has a natural drag effect. It resists any kind of velocity. So you can't just fire the starting pistol and say, well, what happened to the innovation? You have to pulse and pulse again after again to convince people that now is the time for the change. But if you do it enough, you get some wins on the books, right? So we're on the speeding up and focusing on time. We're trying to get to 100 years of time pulled out of acquisition. We're at 78 and a half. And if you look what's in the hopper, there's, there's another 16 or 17 years. So we're really close in the next couple of months to be able to say, hey, we just took a century out of acquisition. Well, why did we do that? Just because? Just it's good to do. No, we took that time back from enemies, from our adversaries. And we're giving that competitive edge to our warfighters. So my hope is, with all of the distractions that this town can create, that we can isolate the field, let them continue to have the reins in their hands, and just see that creative people that are empowered create the change locally. And innovation can never be the charter of an organization. Innovation is an every person job description. Everyone in an organization that has to compete must innovate. The way we do something today can never be acceptable in future. And so I'm really, I'm really excited because the Air Force, it has the propensity to create that culture quickly because the talent and the people that I get to work with could not be higher. 
Well, I, I agree. I concur. My own experience in government was that there's tremendous talent in the organization. I think that's often under uh, under recognized and undervalued sure. on the outside. And there's uh, there is a lot of beauty to being able to unlock that. Um, and I really resonate your comment about time. You know, when I was working rapid acquisition, uh, I would always try to make the argument that. Uh, given that we have, in fact, delivered equipment to the field in less than a year, uh, how will people in the future continue to claim that it can't be done because we've done it? Uh, nonetheless, there's still some of those out there, so <laughs> I appreciate your efforts. And, you know, when you're focused on time, it's, it's hard to be undisciplined. That was, a, that was a good lesson I learned at SCO that I've brought into the Air Force, is that when you look at a program manager and say, reins are in your hand, there's nothing I can add as a senior leader in the Pentagon. I have looked at your program in this review for one hour. You have looked at it for six months. How could I possibly provide an insight that is deeper? I might be able to give you a tool to empower you more, something like a pitch day authority. So now you can work with small businesses in your program. So leadership should always be creating tools instead of rules. But the idea that you're gonna add some technical content is, is too far-fetched. And if any of you have managed a program you probably had that moment with a senior leader where you had to act like they were making a good recommendation or asking a good question. Right? So it's just, just own that, that we should delegate to the field, we should trust them. But what happens if the reins are in your hands? You don't want to fail. You're not just going fast today, you have to go fast over the long run. So do you care about your risk? Yes. Do you care about your cost? Yes. Empowerment tends to create a discipline, but it's a discipline that matters. And a lot of what occurs in the 5,000 acquisition system, if followed to the T, is a lot of box checking that doesn't matter. But you can obviously tailor. I mean, that's what the system's supposed to do. We've gotten away from the culture that does that. But if you take on the full burden, a lot of that discipline is false discipline. It's the appearance of rigor. But when you're empowered, you take on real discipline and real rigor. And that's what I'm seeing in programs. They're doing what they need to do to succeed, and nothing that does not add to that mission it goes back to culture. Be focused, deliver quickly, empower the future warfighter to have a cutting edge. And so I would like to talk a little bit about outcomes. You, know, you mentioned being an optimist. I would say my personal assessment after 25 years in Washington is this is not an optimistic town. Um, <laughs> but having said that, uh, the last couple of years, I have a lot of people who come into conversations, CSIS we have about acquisition, who have expressed optimism. And they say, we see a momentum for change. We think that's encouraging. And then there's the but. And the but, but is, um, but yes, there's momentum for change. Yes, new things are happening. but. What about the delivery end? You know, what is what is really coming out of this? Will it will it sustain, uh, and what will it really deliver? And so you've talked about, you know, taking time out of uh, programs, um, but what are the concrete wins that we can book now? What are the ones that we're close to that we should keep our eye on, that we can really say, yes, this is this is different, or this is where the progress is happening and where we can expect to continue it. Uh, I think when we hit 100 years, that's that's a chance for us to step back from what we've done in the tailoring and the 804 authorities and to say, what have we learned that is more general about doing acquisition fast? I think they're not gonna be new lessons. It's gonna be rediscovering old lessons. If you go back to like the Packard acquisition policies and you read them from 1971, a lot of what's in those policies sounds like what we ought to be doing today, right? Focus more on hardware, less on paperwork. Fly before you buy trade-off performance to keep schedule. Those were religious dogma for me at SCO, and they matter to me just as uh, religiously here in the Air Force. Those are old lessons that we're relearning. I think we'll see that we're just regaining what acquisition was, was originally meant to be, which is buying things smartly and buying them fast, as opposed to um, where I think we went which was trying to make every acquisition a, a chance to really trace dollars and cents to such a degree that it stymied programs. So I'm, um, I think that will be one milestone. And I, I hope that when we hit it, I'll be able to say some very general things about what are working. What I'm noticing kind of at, a, at an anecdotal level is that if there's a major program that you know immediately what you should be doing, there's no question about what you should be doing day one that this tailoring and the 804 authorities are perfect. Right? They let you get on contract much faster and you go ahead and start the thing that you should be doing today. So something like the B-52 commercial re-engineering program, 
there's, there's no doubt what we should be doing. We should have the commercial vendors on contract and working with Boeing. So why would you want to take the year and a half of steps in a generic acquisition process to do that? You know exactly what you should be doing. So I think we'll learn, I think we'll learn the type of program where starting early makes sense. Software is one. Classic prototyping is another. So that's, that's one thing I would recommend you, you keep, your, keep your eye on. Another thing that I think will be really important is are we able to scale our software factory concept across the Air Force? So Kessel Run, awesome. if you've not heard of it, it's a software factory we have up in Boston. They're doing the Air Operations Center, pushing code out every six weeks. Uh, they're now just starting on a cloud-based variant of ALICE, the F-35's logistics system, and I was hoping to deliver their first code out to Nellis in, uh, in about another week, which will significantly improve the lives of our maintainers there. So that's awesome. We've got a great group of people there that know how to code and that are using modern DevOps practices and are pushing capabilities out to the warfighter quickly. We've just stood up our second called Kobayashi Maru, if you're a Star Trek fan. That's the impossible scenario, Kirk Hacks, so we thought that's a great name because it's Kurt Hacking Code. So that's out at SMC, Space and Missile Center. And they have gotten up and are delivering their first code to General Raymond. Now we're starting our third down at Montgomery. It's called Bespin, back to Star Wars. So we've got to keep the Star Wars and Star Trek worlds balanced, right? Or the, the, the gods of nerdom <laughs> will not be happy with the Air Force. I think one huge litmus test is are we able, as we stand these up, to keep consistency, to have standards so that we can justify the budget to Congress, and eventually go to scale. Every program will eventually have to have an agile software pipeline. Software just looks like a service contract. So you build your hardware, and then you just have level of effort software work forever. And I don't know what software development versus sustainment is. It's just software to me. So that culture shift is going to be really important to speed because the future war fight is going to be won based on coding. Right? World War II was won based on code breaking, but the future war is going to be won based on code making. So we've got to be able to code everywhere. And if you think a future war where you have to change your code every day is too far-fetched, I don't. I think AI will eventually take us there. So that's one I'm tracking really, really closely, Andrew, because I think we could be the best Air Force building airplanes and satellites and be bad at software and still lose. Mm. So let me flip that around. I said, where do we look for the successes? One of the things that, that has occurred to me is if we're taking a fail fast model, then I want to see some failures that happen and I want to see them happen early because uh, there's going to be failures. Failure happens, uh, particularly if you're taking risk. Uh, and so, in some cases, I think to myself, maybe the indicator I should be looking for are the failures, because if, if I don't see any, they're still there. It just means that money is still <laughs> pumping into them. So, uh, I throw that at you. What's your, what, how, do you how do you respond to that? Uh, uh, yeah, I've, you know, I've, I've been in a workforce and had leaders say, we're going to embrace failure, and I knew they didn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> And so when we send that message out to the field, no, it is, it is such an old message that the government has never meant. And so I'm doing everything I can, Andrew, to try to convince the Air Force that I really mean it. We have lots of, 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 of sputters in our startup of Kessel Run. We had a lot at Kobayashi Maru. I'm, I expect that. I expect difficult things to have learning up front, and that's a positive thing. One thing that I'm doing to try to show I really do mean I'm okay with failure is creating awards for them. Mm -hmm. So we just gave out our first awards for spectacular learning events, which is a good failure. <laughs> so, and it, right now they're small things. They're a 500 pound bomb urgent operational need program that tried a couple of Mazda weapons and they didn't work. And another uh, special warfare division program that was trying to get commercial off the shelf UAVs for our special operators, and none of them worked. And another was a technology-based failure out at the, our research lab. They tried a new high-power microwave program, didn't hit its power targets. So no, su no successes here, but isn't that, isn't that a horrible thing to say? We learned, we learned something about the requirements, we learned something about the technology. So it was, it was exciting to bring them in to Washington and give them an award and applaud them in front of their peers. But you know, you know what I'm thinking, right? These are small, protected failures. They're not things that are going to hit the Washington Post. It's not going to hit the attention of this town. 
We have to push the failures up into systems like that. And if, if what happens when we hit a wall is learning, then we've got to call it that and not a failure. And although I am 100% behind making sure our hypersonics programs succeed, I mean, we are like 20 months away from the first operational hypersonics test in the department. Should I expect that test to succeed? This is a regime that's like no other. It's fast, it's hot. I mean, we're gonna learn something. So if, if we succeed the first time and successively thereafter, maybe we're not going fast enough. So we've got to get that first big failure to occur and show that that person's career does not go south, that we celebrate them and hopefully promote them because we've learned something. And I just, I hope, Andrew, that, that it happens while I'm still here because I will be devoted to that person's career. I've got to get someone up to general officer for a, a spectacular learning event. Or the, I guess the award will really be mine because I'll have failed and creating this culture that embraces failure. Everything's a distribution, right? So if you don't have the, the big failures, there should be no big successes either. And I think right now, we're just starting to move one standard deviation away from conservative, and I've gotta keep pushing it. But that is, that is a truly hard challenge, to get people to trust leadership, to put their careers on the line, and I think it just takes time to build that trust. So I'm gonna keep pulsing message, keep trying to celebrate, learning events and hopefully have that brave individual in the Air Force say, I'm going to trust this guy and I'm going to stick my neck out. And if they're watching this video, I will defend you uh, to the grave because without people like you, we won't have those huge successes. And all of it should be viewed as what the Air Force embraces as its acquisition philosophy. You go through the X-plane hall in the Pentagon, a lot of those planes didn't work. They're still in the hall. We need a hall for things like this. Century Series Fighters Day, not everyone worked, right? But we don't consider them failures. We consider that an awesome epic of aviation. So I think we can get back to it, but we need that, that trailblazer or bellwether to cross a goal line without actually having a product to deliver and the workforce to see, wow, that person went on to great things. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do that too. If I dig a little, you've, you've talked about your delegation a lot, and I appreciate that, because I think it's one of the key things that I see happening in the Air Force uh, that, in my personal opinion, is, is somewhat distinguishing from what I see in the other services. Not to say there may not be some delegation happening elsewhere, but it seems to be more, the more of a commitment and a strategy uh, right now with Air Force acquisition. Um, but my question is, how far does that go? In other words, uh, I could see a lot of layers to this. You know, one is you as the acquisition executive can say, I delegate, but there are other actors in the acquisition system. Uh, you know, one of uh, your predecessors in the acquisition game, Heidi Shu, gave a talk here and talked about all the people trying to steer the bus, the acquisition bus. There are a lot of them. Uh, and that's true in the Air Force too. And um, so how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the other entities of the system that might say, yeah, sure, the acquisition executive has given you control, but I still have uh, my piece of the game. And then the second piece is, um, your, I would be interested in your experience uh, on whether people can take it. In other words, that you delegate it to them, but do they really embrace it and run with it? Or you know, how, how, how does that work out? It's, it, I, it's almost like I gave you that question. It's a question <laughs> I'm so glad you asked because it's, um, it's you an didn't, important- You did by the way, just in case no, you're wondering. No, but <laughs> Uh, that's one where you started going down this path. I was like, oh, I'm so glad we get to talk about this because it is such a big issue with us. Um, I think delegation is the only way that we compete and win. Hmm. So on the operational side of the Air Force, you delegate responsibility to the lowest echelon that can execute commander's intent because whatever side can do that the best is more responsive, it's going to be more agile, more lethal. The equivalent should happen in acquisition. And we've taken a big step. So all the major ACAT-1 programs, those are the, those are the big ones. None, they're still held up at, up at my level. And in future, I don't think all of them will be. They're not all the same. But those have come from OSD to me. Well, I can't do all of those and all the ACAT-2s and 3s. So all ACAT-2s, all of them, that's what most of acquisition is. Only 10% of our budget is the ACAT-1 programs. Most of acquisition is small programs. All the ACAT 2s are delegated to our PEOs, Program Executive Officers, and we've created more Program Executive Officers. We have four more that we've created for space, 
created the PEO for rapid sustainment out at the Lifecycle Management Center. So we have a, a program executive officer focused on innovation and sustainment. So not only have we delegated down, we've created more decision authorities. They in turn have delegated all of our ACAT 3s down to their deputies or to senior material leaders. All of that's great, but that just meant we, we took power from the AQ level and we've pushed it down to the 06 level with great results. But you know what, what we gotta do next is we gotta keep pushing it down. You can't be a colonel in the Air Force before you get the ability to make a big decision with real consequences. So below the senior material level, we have material leaders. And my quest this year is to ask every senior material leader, what are you doing to empower your material leaders? What should we expect to do at that level of leadership? What authorities do we give? What decisions do you give? So that by the time they become 06s, they've already learned a little bit about making decisions. They've had their failures at the right level, but then we can't stop there, right? They have to delegate down again and again. And so I'm asking every program to tell me, what are you doing to push authority down? Because it's not just about making decisions, so that's important. That will add to our agility and speed, but we're really training future leaders. Can't have people become you know, a, a colonel before they really get the reins in their hands. We have to, at the lieutenant level, we have to give people the ability to make decisions. And there are pockets of this in our classified work because we have fewer people in it. Junior acquisition professionals often have a lot more responsibility. Met with one program and there's a lieutenant that's in charge of the software and a captain that's in charge of the system engineering for something that's never been done. And I completely trust them. The enthusiasm was, was infectious. But unless you get that rare chance right now, if you're in a bigger program office, you're probably not being equipped. So we, like a Japanese rock garden, we continue to have to rake so that the lines are clear, the flow down is clear. And if we can give those junior acquisition professionals that sense of, wow, the Air Force trusts me, I really need to get this right, I trust the talent that I see there. One area that I, I have some optimism and enthusiasm is this pitch day stuff we're doing with small businesses. Like we have $660 million in small business innovative research funds that we have to spend for small business. It's set aside, it's a tax. We shouldn't think of it as a tax, we should think of it as a great gift. But what a great area to get young professionals involved. And most of the people who made pitch day work were captain level and below. So I see that as one area that I can ask every program for your junior, your, your, your captains and your tenants, make them your venture ninjas. Give them the reins of that 660 million. Invite them to go find the creatives in the world and bring them into the program. So we've got to give them that experience early on to energize them so that they stay and learn and grow. And by the time their senior material leaders or program executive officers or SAF AQs, they've had a whole career of decision making and trust based on that empowerment. And if we do that, world better watch out. And you've found success at making sure that the budget systems can sustain that and that they can buy into the idea that at the resource level we're talking about that a, you know, an 06, an 04, 05 is allowed to make that decision on or can get the resources from the person who has it to, to support their work and that the requirements community can kind of meet their pace of operations. It, I'll do requirements in the good resource. So okay. our requirements community is awesome in the Air Force. So when we sped up acquisition, they sped up requirements. There's a rapid requirements process, and I have no program where a requirement is holding us back. So I've got to give a big shout out to our operators and warfighters. If you think that speeding up and competing is just a theme for me, it was awesome to have our chief of staff at the last Air Force Association talk at length in press interviews about the need to speed up acquisition, the need to trust people. It's not just for the sake of buying things, it's for the warfighter. The warfighter needs a competitive acquisition system more than anyone. And I, I'm just so happy that our Air Force requirements owners set good requirements. They don't set the bar up so high that we don't have anyone who can build or, or build to spec or build today. And that's what's allowed us to see a lot of the, com the competitive gains that we've had in programs where competition has brought costs down. So over 15 billion last year, just by having multiple vendors and shootouts. And that's because the requirements were set well. Uh, they're also really great when we do Section 804 programs. 
of trading off performance to maintain schedule. That is coming from war fighters, mm. not from acquisition. They would rather have an 80 or 90 percent solution now than a perfect solution that's too late. And when I was here last talking at CSIS in my skill role, that's what I said, is that we're producing 90 percent solutions that are good enough today, that give war fighters options today. That has to be done everywhere. That has to be the way we do acquisition. And we can. We have the authority to do that. We have war fighters who can do that. Let's shift to finance. That's the hardest part, is that good ideas get money a year later, if lucky. <laughs> and so one thing I wish the Air Force would do would try to consolidate its program elements so that you could shift between related programs based on discovery and learning. And that's something we're trying to encourage. Budget stability matters. It's a talking point for every senior leader, but you can't do change, you can't do innovation without resources to back it. But what I don't allow, budget instability cannot be the reason you fail to innovate. You may not do as well as you could have with money in your pocket, but the constraint that that budget limitation imposes is an opportunity to think creatively. And we can't tell future airmen, I'm sorry we did not give you the world's best Air Force because we were under continuing resolution or sequestration. It's not acceptable. The stakes are too high. So though I hope for budget stability, we can never let that be the crutch that lets us limp out of the fight, right? Budget instability has to be an opportunity for us to rise to the occasion and show our creativity. And if we get budget stability, then it ought to allow us to take our game to the next level. I've got a handful of additional questions. I'm going to ask one more and then turn to the audience. Uh, and as usually happens, they'll ask the question I was going to ask anyway, because we have a very smart audience. Um, but just before we do that, I wanted to talk, as you talked about the, the requirements, folks, the value there and the feedback. And so, um, you know, I think one of the critiques I would make of the traditional acquisition system is we sometimes fall in the trap that the requirement is set and then the requirements guys go off and do something else and the acquisition community just churns on that and there's not that continuous back and forth. But it sounds like you're seeing that back and forth. So I'm interested in the mechanisms that allow that or is it just people, you know, with goodwill working together? Uh, and then secondly, where you see within the DOD, not even necessarily the Air Force, kind of the experimentation, the folks who can, uh, who can turn those capabilities into concepts of operations and give you a real sense that this is the capability we need that we're moving towards. There are a couple areas that are helping us completely flip the script on how requirements and acquisition work together. 804 authorities, that's the authority Congress gave us, that really isn't much different than the 5000 series, except that it does pull programs out of our joint capability um, requirements process. It's outside of JSONs. Hmm. So you might think, well, that just means acquisitions off the, you know, off the ranch doing whatever they want. It's actually created the closest relationships between the requirer and the acquirer. Because without, without the formal requirement, which by the way, requirements owners hate going through that process just as much. <laughs> so what we found is that the, the major commands are putting their people inside the programs. And as we build and engage industry, we come back, so it's the loop you're talking about. Yeah. You know, we come back and say, well, here's what industry is able to make. Do you want us to proceed and give you what is possible today or continue to improve and give you something better tomorrow? I have not been told, wait till tomorrow yet. And so, stepping back from the way we do acquisition, it's backwards. It really is. We, we have general officers, four-star generals, that have trained their whole career to know how to accept risk. It's the most strategic thing they do. Continue mission and pick acceptable risk. And we trust them with the security and defense of this country, but we deprive them of that in acquisition because we don't bring them a choice where they accept risk. We ask them up front, tell me what you want, and I'll go buy it for you no matter how long it takes and no matter what it costs. Why would it not be the other way around where you start with a general sense of what they need and then bring them back choices that the industry base can build and the performance that comes from them and let them either accept the risk of fielding now or choose to accept the risk of waiting and fielding something better later. That's all that 804 is letting us do. It's flipping the process and coupling us to the warfighter. It's truly a three-legged race. But because we've learned that in the 804 programs, we're just now doing that in 5,000, which is no different. 
we can make 5,000 programs go nearly as fast as 804 programs. And of the 78 and a half years that I mentioned, about a third of it is 5,000 programs. And I expect that it'll be a bigger proportion in the future as people learn this lesson. So this is doing a wonderful thing for us. It is getting the paperwork out of the requirements and acquisition process and just making us one team, running a three-legged race over distance. So if you, if you think speeding up acquisition is just an acquisition thing, no, it's an Air Force thing. The whole Air Force is deciding to do this. If you pull me out of this chair and put General Raymond or, or General, uh, General Ray here, or any of our MAGCOMs, General Miller, they're gonna give you the same talking points. We gotta move. I need an acquisition system that can give me options today, not things that are too late. And another thing that's helping us foment this change is the DevOps and software, mm -hmm. right? So we often think about the dev, the coders up at Kessel Run, but just as many people are operators. And what's also awesome is a lot of our good coders are operators. So it's creating this interplay between the person who's gonna use the code and the person writing it. And stepping back as the, the acquisition exec, I think, well, wait a second, this is awesome. Because I probably don't need to have someone that's doing coding on a program go through the same DAU training as someone that's gonna ma you know, manage a major bomber or fighter program. And so I've got our team up at PEO Digital working on how do we certify someone to give them acquisition credentials to do DevOps. And what I hope will happen is we'll have just as many operators who say, I'm tired of using this system, I wanna get in and fix it, and they come in from the field, code for one tour of duty, and then take that code back out and actually use it. That would be awesome. If that happens, and my goal is to make it happen, I think we'll be able to bring more operators in to a portion of acquisition, which is only gonna make the tie closer. So one of the things I cannot underscore enough is I benefit every day from close, close ties to the operator. And one of the things that helps me in a way that I, I did not understand before I took this job, so I love working for our secretary. She is an awesome strategic leader and loves acquisition. If you hear a talk from her, she talks a lot about it, which is awesome for our workforce. But, but I was introduced to her by our chief, General Goldfein. General Goldfein asked me to come out of SCO and consider being the acquisition exec. And it helps me every day for our warfighters to know that the acquisition system that we're building up isn't just one that our secretary is championing, though she is. It's one that our chief wanted. And I hope that that close connection between the acquisition exec and the chief of staff will continue because we're here for them. We're here for their successor to make sure that they're able to say, we're gonna bequeath the world's greatest Air Force to the next generation because it was bequeathed to us. Well, I wanna open up at this point to audience questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. And when the mic comes to you after you've been uh, the lucky winner to be selected, uh, just give us uh, who you are and make your question pointed and brief. So uh, why don't we start uh, here? Cynthia Iris at Harvard. Um, you talked about this a little bit, but I'd be curious if you could go a little bit deeper on this. I'd like to ask about using the Blackbird as an example when you say you want to relearn lessons. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'm not going to ask about the Blackbird. If you'd like to answer it, that's okay. My question really is, um, what do you think is good enough? So in software acquisition, in the business world, it's good, fast, and cheap. Pick two. In the military, you add safe. Mm -hmm. So when you look at your criteria and you're making decisions and you're writing a check in three minutes, how did, where did you vet the people that you just wrote a check to in three minutes? So, I mean, so there are two things, right? There's software, safety of software, and then there's also how did we know the companies that we, so those are actually two distinct things. Now, I'm happy to address both, but I don't want to confuse people listening. So let's talk about how do we know that software is, is going to be safe for us to use. It's a big deal. If I, if I were to tell you I got the plan, I don't. I have ideas, and the first idea is to try to get out of the old school defense style software development and to shift to modern cloud-based tools, which are more secure than the old development tools that we use. That should be a big improvement. But your point is the tip of a bigger iceberg, which is acquisition tends to focus on cost, schedule, performance, and if, based on my talk today, per, uh, schedule is the thing that I care the most about. But security's got to come into the fold. It has to. I don't know if we'll end up awarding contracts based on security, 
or if we'll end up just making it kind of a standard that if you don't design to a set of NIST-like requirements that you don't compete. I think the latter is actually a better model because I fear that if we made security a competitive factor, that it would not encourage best security practices to be shared across defense. But I'm just starting to think about this, so share your thoughts with me if you disagree. Let's shift to um, how we know the companies that are coming in are good companies, is that we do our research. They have, to, they have to apply to SAMS and DUNES databases, and so we're able to know that they're U.S. companies, that they have uh, you know, a legitimate business case, and um, by the time they come to pitch day, you think that you know, when, they, when they apply, it's about 30 days before, they're, before they come, so that gives us time to do our research. And you know, I, I want to set the, the expectations. These are phase one awards in small business, which I don't even like that term. I wish we would just call these venture works because small business sounds pejorative to me. This is not small to me. This is a strategic thing to me. So for our venture work, our phase one, it's on average maybe 100K where the company gets $50,000, $60,000 in the initial installment. So we have a high risk tolerance for this. And so we want to make sure that we're not thinking that we have to see the return individually for a specific award, but we do want to see it at the portfolio level. So the metric for me uh, is going to be eventually how many of these phase ones go to a phase two, how many go to a phase three, and then ultimately, the ultimate metric always has to be how many went into programs that delivered for the warfighter. Putting companies on contract, cool though it is, awesome that the government can do it in three minutes, Best quote we have out of New York was, I can get a contract faster from the Air Force than I can get a beer in New York. It's a direct <laughs> quote from a company. That's awesome. That gives us a completely different role to play with startups, but none of it matters if it doesn't go into capability for the warfighter. So this cannot be a flash in the pan uh, trend. It cannot be a cool event that we use for PAPR. This has got to be a strategic endeavor for the Air Force to keep bringing companies in, to keep maturing their technologies, to keep exposing them to our mission, so that ultimately our warfighters benefit from technologies in their professional lives that they benefit from in their personal lives. Good question, good two questions. We'll come up here in the front. Well, my name is Tony Spadaro. Uh, let me, uh, I want to address a question about how we can take innovation and into acquisition on scale. And to do that, let me just put a historical note on this. I can recall a time way back when we had all sorts of, of innovation and uh, uh, delegation of authorities to the extent that we had majors running billion dollar programs in the NRO. We had SARSAP programs that allowed people to do this. Now, that model succeeded because of special acquisition authorities and protected environments. Is it now time at your level to start seriously asking, what are we protecting them from? And address that as a way of scaling up. I, I, I hope that we are. I, I don't think we've pushed the authority all the way down. I would love to be able to tell you, here's the level of responsibility we give lieutenants. Here's the level of responsibility we have, give captains. I can tell you the level of responsibility we get down to the 06 level, which is a huge shift from it being up at the head of the Air Force all the way out in the field. So we have to continue this trend because I bet on talent. I would not be here telling you we're going to delegate, we're going to empower, we're going to run fast if we did not have talent. And I get wild by it every day. The Pentagon is a very frustrating place to work, very. And a lot of times you can have a day where you just want to rage quit the whole thing and think we're not going to win because I spent the whole day talking about silly things that are not about competing and winning, not about fighting today, not about fighting in the future. But then I'll always have a meeting with someone in the Air Force that's coming to brief me on their program, get a decision, fill me in on something they're doing that's new, and I leave ready to come to work the next day. It is an iron, sharpening iron effect that I, I count on, I depend on now to get through the bureaucracy. I think if we can keep pushing authority down, that people will want to join the Air Force to do acquisition. It may sound silly, I want to make that true. But I can't make it true if when you join, you don't get to make choices. I can't make that true if when you join, you don't get to work with the whole world of technology. 
And I can't make that true if when you join, programs are so few and far between that you only have a couple on your resume. Right, so there's a lot that has to be done. I could give a whole talk on what we're trying to do to speed up the pace at which we do major programs, a thing for another time. But all of that has to happen to keep this business inspiring. But whatever we've done in the past, it has brought talented, inspiring people into our workforce. And so step one is, if the talent's there, and we bet on talent and the operational side of the Air Force, why aren't we doing an acquisition? We're gonna learn this lesson quickly, though. Because we do have a part of the Air Force that knows that a decision that has to come back to headquarters and then go back down, that's a losing decision. So more to follow on that, but great question. Yeah. I want to come over here to Yasmin. Right here on the right. My right. <laughs> Hi, Yasmin Tajday, National Defense Magazine. I was wondering if you might be able to just uh, highlight one or two technologies that uh, were um, at pitch day that you were really excited by. I'm sure you're excited by all of them, but just maybe one or two you could highlight. Uh, yeah, I, I was excited by almost everything I saw. What I was excited about is um, we had about a 50-50 mix of companies that had been trying to get through into the defense department and had, had not been able to, and about half of our companies had never worked with us, so it was a great diversity. The ones that I tend to get personally excited about are AI related. I, I am desperate for the Air Force to operationalize AI. It is ironic that the first two letters in Air Force are AI, yet we have so little of it in our operational force. Our sustainment world has done awesome. I love sustainment. If you ever want to get me energized, ask me to talk about our innovation in sustainment because they are off doing 3D printing and agile manufacturing. Uh, and they're doing predictive maintenance, which is AI applied to maintenance, um, which is awesome. So they're actually blazing the trail for us. We now need it in the operational side of the Air Force. And so companies that had technologies that allowed images to be automatically detected and pattern of life uh, uh, projected based on historical data make me really excited. Because as we get back into competing with peer powers, we, we can't have so many airmen looking at computer screens, looking at video. So I see a huge potential for us to use that kind of technology so that airmen aren't looking for objects of interest. They're being shown objects of interest. And then they take the next step, which is more strategic at a higher level. You could imagine if we did that, you could collapse the number of people that are doing that kind of work. Rather than you watching the feed from one drone, why couldn't you manage a fleet of them so we can shift airmen to where we need them now, which is thinking about the Pacific and Europe and peer competition. So AI was really exciting to me, but we saw inspiring medical capabilities that could save lives for our special operators, and it was just a fantastic day. I really wish I could mind meld with you. If I could, even the greatest skeptics about defense might actually have a second thought. There, there's electricity in what we did. And so now I've just got to plug the Air Force into it. And wherever the next pitch day will be, and we'll wait on the secretary to say, I know I'm going to be there, just for my mental health. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's come in the middle, because I haven't done that. So here, right here on the third row. Thanks. Uh, Sarah Sirota with Inside Defense. Uh, you mentioned briefly about high-powered microwaves not reaching their expected targets. And I was wondering if you could talk about what that means for the future of directed energy research at the Air Force? Sure, no, we've got lots of directed energy work at the research lab. This was just one project amongst many. There are multiple high power microwave projects and many are doing well. But this was a program called Thor that was trying to package high power microwave in a, in a small space and it just simply wasn't able to hit targets that, that mattered for mission. Well, we've learned when you try to do that kind of work, it tells you what the limiting factor is. That's the thing you need to improve to take the next step. So I wanted to make sure that our failures weren't just programmatic failures. I wanted to have technology failures because we're going to have them. We're going to have failures when it's military unique, and we're going to have failures when we apply commercial technology. And so all I'm doing is stepping back and asking each one of these uh, programs that are submitting for an award is, did the Air Force learn something because of their efforts? And every one we awarded, we learned a lot. So that should be celebrated as part of the process of getting to our next step. And so I have no doubt that eventually the program will be back, that they'll have 
They'll have tackled their technology challenge, and they'll be ready to take the next step in their program. But they know where to focus now because of the first step that they've taken. Even though it wasn't successful, it will ultimately be successful because of the learning that they've had. So very proud of all of those programs. And I just expect me over time just to keep having more of these things to share because if I don't say them publicly, they're just things we do behind closed doors, then we're also feeding into that it's not real. It's not real that we want to embrace failure. It is. And so more to follow on this. Um, let's go. I've been neglecting this left side a little bit, so we'll come here on the, on the aisle. Uh, good morning. My name is Don Wheeler, and uh, my question is this, I guess it's in a couple of parts. Uh, what, apart from uh, delegation, can be done to um, encourage this kind of mindset, innovative mindset, uh, to push it down into the field, uh, as you say, uh, or moreover, down to the uh, companies you do business with? And uh, the second part of the question is, what, if anything, uh, is the competition doing to encourage innovation? So competition meaning competition here within the industry base or competition uh, meaning other uh, countries? Russia, China. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm doing all I know to do to try to create the culture and buzz. So if there's something that occurs to you that we ought to be doing, then please tell me. Uh, this is an experiment for me every day. I've never run an organization of this size, and I'm trying to take lessons learned from past jobs and apply them here and modify and try to learn new ones. But the thing I said earlier about bureaucracies naturally creating a drag effect is, is real. Change is resisted. But there is, there is something like breaking through the sound barrier. If you, you're resisted up front, but if you can go fast enough, you can actually go faster than the system can react. So a lot of, a lot of what I'm trying to do is just make sure that the changes that we've started with delegating and taking time out and doing DevOps on software, I didn't even talk about digital engineering, which is a big thrust that we keep moving. We try to move faster than the bureaucracy's ability to resist them. And you have to keep pumping energy and focus, which is a lot of, of where I spend my time, is actually having to focus on things, because if you don't, they'll start to, to settle. Um, yeah, I, I rarely uh, will talk about specifics uh, from, other, from other countries, just because I, I don't want them to know what I'm, I'm thinking. But what I will say is that we cannot even though it's a slow chess game, we cannot kid ourselves that China and Russia are no joke. The, the world we're in today has no precedent. And I fear that we'll say this is Cold War Part Two, or we won't say that because everyone gets on the right talking points in this town, but we'll, we'll default to that mindset. We have never been in a world like today. The acquisition system that won the Cold War developed its own technology. Most of the technologies that changed the world, right, computers and uh, satellites and all of that, were created by the US military and then applied to military systems. And eventually, and you're seeing it now, eventually transitioned to commercial. And so the pace of programs was slow because the technology burden was high. And it was only done in a few places, government labs and defense primes. Now, you can't turn a page in any news article without there being some technology-related story or issue. And so the fact that so much technology is available means the old system does not matter anymore. We have to turn it inside out so we're an ingester of technology. We'll still develop technology ourselves. The government is not bad at developing technology. It's just the proportion of technology it's providing is small. We have to turn ourselves inside out and be able to use technologies faster than any, than any adversary. And that's my litmus test, is if quantum computing pops up you know, and really is something that we could, we could ruggedize and put out into the field, can we do that faster? What about, you know, I mean, AI we should have out in the field now, so we're behind on that. We need to move on it. And if we can do that, then you can actually shift your competitive model into one that's imposing cost and creating issues for your enemy to react to. So why should we be reacting to the threats we see? Why shouldn't they be reacting to us? You get to set the cadence if you're faster at creating things. And so that's the strategy for me in a nutshell, is that if we can create and field things fast, if we're connected with the entire industry base so that the best technologies are available to us, if we are fast-tracking big ideas, big ideas that will impose cost and create conundrums, 
then we can make opponents react to us and pull them off their game plan, no matter what they're working on. All right, we have, uh, we're almost at the end of our time, so um, uh, I, sometimes you have just a couple hands, you can get them all in, but I'm afraid that's not gonna be the case today. So uh, let's come over here on the, right, we'll have to make this the last one, so my apologies to those who didn't get a chance to ask. Uh, Hi, I'll do, and for the, for the woman behind, I can tell you're disappointed. I will take your question, too. <laughs> <laughs> Be fair. Uh, Vivian Mashi with Defense Daily. I wanted to ask you about the Air Force's relationship with the Space Development Agency now that that has been, the directive has been signed for that to be established. So how are you and your role going to be working with Mike Griffin and people at the SDA to ensure that you're not duplicating efforts when it comes to space development? Because at the end of the day, duplication does not seem like a speeding up acquisition. So if you could clarify which efforts you guys might separate and that sort of thing. That'd be yeah, great. I mean, it's, uh, we've got the memo signed, so it'll be determined in the doing. And there is a great model for us working with, with outside agencies. There's been a long-term historical relationship between the Air Force and DARPA that have benefited both. And we still have amazing partnerships with them right now in hypersonics and things we can't talk about. So I don't know if it'll evolve along those lines or along others, but, but it'll evolve based on actually doing work together. And so our space acquisition programs are doing great under the new authorities. Um, some of the most creative plans that we have, some of the most strategic thinking and growing the industry base are in programs like, like Next Gen OPIR and Enterprise Strategic SATCOM and Protected Tactical SATCOM. I could keep going. Launch is, is pretty amazing, too. Um, but space is an area we need options fast. I could not have a clearer demand signal from the warfighters that they need things to deal with space being a not-so-nice place during a conflict. And so anyone that can help us speed it up, get there faster, bring in new technologies, just like DARPA has historically done, uh, we will find a way to work with anyone that helps us win and shape the future. Well, thank you very much, audience, for those questions. Uh, thank you, Will, for coming and for having this discussion. And uh, I know I'm going to walk out of today with my uh, optimism factor boosted. Um, and uh, so I appreciate that. And it's a nice thing to have early in the morning. Um, and uh, please join me in thanking oh, all for no